just nice when you put in a lot of time into something like getting normals and positions right and you're able to see the effects of that that's what we have right here this is a more complicated scene i've obviously added a lot of geometries here i believe the torus is new the sphere is new the scene looks very bluish because I've set ambient light to be just a hint of blue. I wanted to be able to tell the difference between ambient light and diffused light. You can see right here where it's extremely white. This is direct light or diffused light. Same thing up here. And then you can see these hints of red. And that is our specular light. Just glazing, glancing, bouncing off the surface and hitting our eye. And we've studied all these lighting techniques obviously we don't have shadows if we did have shadows then i wouldn't see this specular light right here because the teapot would be blocking this spec but we'll get into shadows later shadows we actually have to learn many more things to implement shadows shadows could be pretty expensive but as i fly around the scene here hopefully you can see the lighting lighting makes sense that specular light again bouncing off the edge of the te torus not teapot torus there and follow that specular light as I strafe to the left you can see it leaves the top of the cube and it'll it'll hit the surface of the plane down there In fact, let me see if I can get to an area where it might make sense look at those specular highlights those red specular highlights off the top of the torus Anyway, let's get down closer. That's kind of cool how that specular light just blends right into that arrow. It's because we handled our transforms of, of our vertices and our normals correctly that that happens. It's actually not too hard with the arrow because it's centered on the origin. But maybe I can get in a position where we can see it on the cube. If I go to the right here, yeah, you see that specular highlight hits the top of the cube. And that's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. And then let's take a look from the light's point of view. Don't blink. Look at that specular light glazing, glancing, whatever, off the edge of the sphere there. Over here on the side where the light bulb is, you can see everything is nice and diffusely lit. It makes sense with the light bulb right here. I'd see all this lit and this lit and this lit. But the other side where we flew from, it was nice and dark. So there you go, a nice, complete scene. Let me minimize that for a minute. Go here to our code shape generator. I added a make sphere, a make torus. The sphere and the torus essentially call the the plane cube, and then it takes the plane and wraps the plane like wallpaper around a ball. With the torus, it turns the plane into a cylinder and then bends that cylinder around to make the sphere. So anyway, I have the, that code there. I don't think I commented it very well, but you can grab that code at my website computersciencevideos.org uh, primitives dot zip and you do that and, and it will download primitive zip to your hard drive you can see I've downloaded it a few times but there you go a much more interesting scene and it's fun once you have lighting working to get that going but I want to make this scene a little more interactive I want to be able to move that light around I want to be able to adjust the various colors on the different shapes so we need to add some intera interactivity to our UI. We're going to have to kick in a QT a little bit and add some QT elements. And then also, as I was doing all this coding offline, it was just a pain. I'll admit, it was just a pain. I had to do the cube. And the cube looks a lot like the arrow, except it's arrow stuff instead of cube stuff. And, oh, I had to do the plane. And the plane looks a lot like the other stuff. And do the teapot, except the teapot model to world transformation matrix a little bit different but other than that everything's the same as everything else it's just a bunch of copy and paste and and change up their model to world matrices so we need to make a renderer that will make all this easy right now we're doing this a very hard way by coding it directly into our gl window and and doing the transforms by hand a lot of copy and paste you know what i'm doing here i've covered this in the previous videos so i'm not going to cover it again here but i had to send all the data down here we go. Send all the data down into my buffer. I had to capture the number of indices. I had to keep track of the offsets. Set up all the vertex arrays. Set up all the attribs. Oh, what a headache. We need to make a renderer to do that. But before we do a renderer, I want to show you how to make this scene a little more interactive with the mouse. Be able to adjust some variables in real time instead of having to adjust them, recompile and rerun, adjust them, recompile and rerun, adjust them, recompile and rerun. That gets old. So I'm going to show you how to do that with the UI and then I think we'll move on to doing a render. Unless, let me go look at my notes actually. 
Okay, I'm back looking at my my notes. I'm not going to guarantee this order, but I think what we'll do is is uh, add some UI sliders. We need to talk about attenuation as a light gets further and further away from an object, then the light won't affect that object as much. For example, as you're driving down the road and your headlights, they, they light up the road right in front of you, pretty bright, bright enough that you can drive, but then anything beyond that, even though your light's pointing that way, it's it's still pretty dark. We need to talk about that math. But we'll do that after adding the UI so I can move my light away from the scene and you can actually see it happen in real time. And then once we have that UI, I think we'll go into building a renderer so we don't have all that copy and paste. So hope you enjoyed the playlist so far. Hope you're learning a lot and we're going to keep going.